Hi everyone. Um, yeah, my name's Ray. I'm from Australia. And yeah, I'm here to talk to you about sea turtle skull shape and what that can tell us about the evolution. Uh, so for those who don't know much about sea turtles, they are a, they're a globally distributed um, group from like all the way from the Arctic Ocean to all the way down to the Southern Ocean, concentrated around the tropics, but they're pretty much found in every ocean in the world. And they're a very small taxonomic group for how well known they are. There's only seven species within, uh, seven species within six genera, which are the green sea turtle, the leatherback, flatback, hawksbill, loggerhead, and then the two Ridley sea turtles, camp, uh, the olive Ridley up here. Uh, so despite their incredibly small taxonomic size, they have a really diverse diet, um, which pretty much every species is eating something different, from like jellyfish to hard clams and crabs, to seagrass to sponges, very, a very diverse diet. But to add to the weirdness of this, when they're adorable little babies, um, they all eat the exact same thing, uh, which is soft, squishy stuff, pretty much. Uh, zooplankton, pelagic, uh, soft-bodied organisms like zooplankton, smaller jellyfish, and hydrozoans, and yeah, anything they can fit into their mouths, really. Um, so uh, I was kind of wondering what explains this difference. And if we look at sea turtle body type, Babies and adults all kind of have exact, and all the species have the exact same body plan. Large carapace, uh, large foreflippers, small hind flippers. There's a bit of an exception with the leatherback that doesn't have a shell, but it still has a large carapace. So the logical uh, conclusion is to look at the skull and what's going on between the baby and the adult skulls. So uh, my, what I was trying to do was determine exactly what these changes were in um, the ontogeny and also how each species differed from each other and how they grew up. And then to try and explore what are the factors determining skull shape. Is it phylogenetic? Is it eco ecological? So I pretty much grabbed every CT scan, uh, every skull and specimen and ethanol preserved baby that I could, CT scanned them all, and then using geometric morphometrics, I got 46 landmarks and compared all their shape. So as an evolutionary biologist, the first thing I have to look at is the phylogeny. And luckily for me, sea turtle phylogeny in the last 10 or 15 years has been really well resolved. Um, sea turtles, uh, modern day sea turtles form a monophyletic clade. And within that um, group, there are three major groups. The leatherback um, is off on its own. And then the hard shelled sea turtles form two big clades. Uh, the hawksbill, the olive ridley, and the loggerhead in the purple there. And the green and flatback form their own group in gold. So when we're talking about phylogenetic signal as a determinant of skull shape, we'd expect the shape space to represent the phylogeny and it reflect it quite closely, which is what, exactly what we see in hatchlings. They spread out exactly how we'd expect with close related species grouping together and more distantly, ones, distantly related ones off to the side. But when you go to your adults, it's a complete mess. Um, there's, uh, the phylogenetic signal is significantly reduced and even like you can see like close related species uh, like the loggerhead and the Ridley sea turtles, very far apart. Uh, very distant related species like the green and hawksbill, very close together. So phylogenetic signal does not seem to be strong in adults. And so phylogeny is not really explaining the, the skull shape in adults. So this leaves us with ecology. And because of the changing um, diets through, uh, through ontogeny of sea turtles, we have to look at everything together and see how they're changing. So running a principal component analysis, come up with this pretty graph. Um, there's a lot, of, this is very information dense. So the main things I want you to get out of it is that all the specimen, all the points are scaled to specimen size. And that across PC1 left to right, virtually every species, actually all the species get bigger. There's a very strong trend getting bigger across PC1. So we can pretty much assume that PC1 is explaining the shape variation across size. So are these features? Fairly typical for tetrapods. The orbit um, gets proportionally smaller and other sensory structures get proportionally smaller, while trophic structures such as muscle attachment areas get particularly the supraoccipital crest, which is that large pointy blade like structure at the back of the skull, get proportionally larger. And since PC1 is the largest, uh, is the source of the largest variation in sea turtles, um, we can kind of see, and it's related size, it seems that size is the dominant factor in determining sea turtle skull shape. 
So that means we have to explore it a bit more. So if we look at uh, size compared to shape, you can see there's an incredibly strong relationship with uh, sea turtles. It's much stronger than most animals. So if we look at predictor shape score, we can kind of start teasing apart relationships a bit more. And we can see some cool patterns emerging here. So these three species, the hawks, the green sea turtle in gold, and the loggerhead in red, all have virtually the exact same slope and exact same intercept. And they're very similar. The main difference being that the loggerhead just keeps on going. Um, it just, it's a final adult uh, is the final maximum size is much higher shape score and it has a more exaggerated adult features and this is classical case of paramorphy. But when you look at the other hard shell sea turtles like the Olive Ridley and the Flatback, they're showing a very different story. They're quite a bit shifted down in shape score and have a uh, more juvenile skull shape than we would predict. Uh, especially the Flatback in pink, which is a relatively large sea turtle and it has a skull shape very similar to juveniles of other species. And the most extreme case, and this is pedomorphosis, retention of juvenile traits into adulthood. So the most extreme case of this is the leatherback, where its skull shape actually more closely looks like a hatchling of other species than it does the adults. Um, but this is what, this fits into what we know about the leatherback. It has a very cartilaginous skeleton with lack of fusion. But, and to illustrate the differences between this paramorphic and pedomorphic type, uh, I'll show you the two extremes. The loggerhead, which has a very small, on top, with a very proportionally small orbit and massive posterior skull compared to the leatherback, which has a relatively large orbit um, and virtually non-existent supraoccipital crest where all the muscles attach. But if you look at this as a whole picture, especially if you look at just the adults, a uh, kind of cool trend emerges where as you move up shape score, they start eating harder and harder things. And this actually closely reflects to what uh, sea turtles, most sea turtles go through when they progress through diets. They go from soft jellyfish to a more uh, larger, softer stuff in the shallower waters to more generalist to eating harder things. But two don't really fit this trend, which is the uh, uh, hawksbill and the green sea turtle, which have unique diets, a hawksbill eating only sponges virtually, and green sea turtle being a herbivore. And so these don't seem to be associated with size as much as the other diets. So we have to look at shape variation not associated with size, which is PC3 and PC4. So PC3 is mainly about the loggerhead having a fat head. Um, it apparently growing up and getting bigger muscles was enough. It has a very wide skull for all those muscles to fit in. But PC4 is where the interesting stuff is happening that defines the two specialists, and they have, seem to have opposite morphologies. So the green sea turtle, which is a herbivore, has a very short snout, in, it's green sea turtle in gold, has a very short snout, very rounded, very snub nose, and this seems to be well adapted to cropping seagrass and algae off of rocks. While the a hawksbill has a very elongated snout, very pointy, hence its name. Um, and it seems to be well adapted to reaching into crevices and coral cracks and all that to grab out sponges. So if you look at sea turtles as a whole, we see a pattern of exploiting the ontogenetic shifts in diet. So all sea turtles start off eating jellyfish. And so when we see an adult that eats jellyfish, it looks like a hatchling. And then we move up to where most sea turtles move into the shallow water and start eating larger soft-bodied animals we then have a sea turtle adult skull that reflects this diet as well. And then you move into where most sea turtles become generalists and we have an adult skull once again that fits this mold. And at the very end of this trajectory, we have the hard shelled eating loggerheads that eats crabs and clams and everything in between. So we see instead of radically changing skull shape, it seems that sea turtles have just moved up and down this ontogenic gradient to explore several different niches without directly competing with each other and without, doing, uh, without changing the skull too much. But the exceptions to this are the two specialists. So it seems that when you radically shift your diet, such as carnivory to herbivory, as we see in the green sea turtle, and the start getting a very specialist diet in eating almost up to 95% sponges, you can't just rely on this ontogenetic shift. You have to adapt more drastically. Um, 
So what we see in um, sea turtles is that developmental patterns like pa paramor paramorphy and pedomorphy seem to be very important uh, in determining the evolution. Paramorphy seems to have evolved at least once in the loggerhead. Pedomorphy seems to have evolved at least three different times, um, all exploring, exploiting different niches that other sea turtles um, go through. And then when it gets a bit uh, too extreme in diet change, they shift. So sea turtles can kind of have seemed to shortcut it evolution instead of rap rapidly changing the skull, just stop growing up or keep growing up more. And this way they can avoid competition with each other by just moving up and down this developmental pathway. Um, and yeah, I'd like to thank all these people who it would not be possible to do this. And yeah, thanks for listening.